Welcome today to Proverbs Through the Eyes of the Living Letters. <laughs> Get it out right today. Uh, we're going to be continuing on with Proverbs chapter 13, and uh, we're going to be moving into verses 11 through 15. You know, as I was preparing for this particular class today, the Lord really was taking me through a lot of of things that that we've already talked about in one way or another, and uh, and He's taking us just a little bit deeper into uh, into this. I'm I'm excited today because there's one of the proverbs that that I think that all of us at one time or another have quoted, <laughs> you know, at least once or twice. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about that one in here just a just a few minutes, which is verse uh, verse twelve, where it says in the King James, it's it's translated as hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I want to I want to take some time and spending uh, some time with that particular verse as we walk through this. But I love how this is beginning to look at things from that personal position. And uh, these verses are, are looking at it from the ways that we see things. And so let's just go ahead and get things uh, cranking here. Verse 11, it says this in the uh, Passion Translation. And I like to be read both out of both the Passion Translation as well as the Michelet. And uh, verse 11 says this, Wealth quickly gained is quickly wasted. Easy come, easy go. But if you gradually gain wealth, you watch it grow. Now, this from the just the, the onset begins to allow us to see something and look at it from the perspective of wealth. And of course, our minds Im immediately go to the place of talking about income. And of course, this absolutely does refer to this. Uh, I love this because one of the one of the ways that you can see this, and the Michelet kind of talks about it, you know, where wealth that is quickly gained could be because of uh, of irreputable ways of, of gaining another stealing and that sort of thing. And so when wealth comes in a way where it's being stolen or it's being manipulated or that sort of thing, then when it comes quickly and easily, it's also going to be leaving quickly. And uh, so in other words, that easy come, easy go aspect of it. But it goes on to say, it talks about that gradually gaining of wealth. So it's a, it's a place where you're building wealth from the place of the ground up. And and allowing the wealth itself to begin to to grow. Now, how does that how does that fit? That can begin by simple processes of just watching what you're spending to things of uh, of creating savings accounts and and th those sort of things. But again, we're talking about wealth from that place of finances. And again, I agree with this. I'm but I want to take us a little bit different of a perspective on this one. Because wealth can also be seen from a myriad of ways. In other words, wealth can also be seen in understanding or in, in wisdom, if you will. So if you guys remember back, it's been a while since I've talked about this, but you remember when I talked about how wisdom is one? You know, when we look at wisdom, many times we see wisdom and we think that each one of us has a portion of wisdom. Well, that's from the biblical perspective and the Hebraic perspective. That's not quite so. Wisdom is father. If you were to take and and put any one term on wisdom, and yes, I know that the scripture talks about there being a lady wisdom. How can how can this be father? Well, this is the feminine expression of the father himself. From either remember that that father is neither male nor female. He and 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 to try to delineate him to one or the other would would be boxing him in. Uh, so, but yet at the same time, he is neither and yet both. <laughs> All right, don't you love that? Don't you love that that paradox? He's neither, but yet both at the same time. So. When we look at it from that perspective, wisdom is one. The, the place where division takes place, and this isn't necessarily a negative division, it comes in understanding. That part of the wisdom that we receive and that we understand as the wisdom of God. So when I receive of the Father, I'm receiving a great treasure. 
Now hear me out here. I'm receiving a great treasure because the Father has given me a portion of his wisdom. However, if I follow out this analogy and I begin to recognize that Father also gives you a place of his wisdom, but he's going to give you a slightly different perspective than I am, that I'm going to receive. Why? Because it's something that's meant directly for, to you, but it's also something that applies to the whole. The way I like to see it is just like the facets of a diamond, right? You guys have heard me talk a lot about the diamond of Yahweh. And if I see, I can look at this diamond as a whole, and this diamond would represent wisdom. Understanding comes as I look at each one of these individual facets. And as I look at the individual facets, then I recognize that the the perspective to the center of that, I always, I always go to the center of the diamond. And the center of the diamond being that of the Father, that's, that's where the Father resides, is the center of this diamond. And so the reflection and refraction of his light that comes from the center of this diamond and can be seen through each and every one of these facets. All right. So without going too deep into that, if Father has given me a treasure of wisdom, he's given you a treasure of wisdom. When we come together and we begin to share that wisdom, now I am gaining wealth in the understanding and the wisdom of God himself. Why? Because you have an understanding that I don't. I have an understanding that you don't. And the, the two of them and the, the multiplicity of them begin to come together. And as a result, we're gaining wealth. We're gaining treasure. We're gaining understanding. Does that make that make sense? Uh, make it, make it uh, simple, simpler still. Let's say that God gave us all $100 million. But when we come together, there's a place where, as as a whole, where you know, if there's a group of say about ten of us, now we've got a billion dollars amongst the amongst the uh, the ten of us with a hundred million dollars a piece. Ten, am I right? That's a billion dollars. So, so it if we look at that from that perspective of the whole, then the then together there's a greater wealth. In other words, you've heard the old saying, the the sum. The sum of something is greater than its parts. Now, I'm not trying to reduce anything here. I'm just trying to give it an analogy and a metaphor of this place of how as we are echad, as we are one in Father, then in this place we each and every one of us become even more wealthy. That's why in this class, for those of you that are just joining us on YouTube, uh, in this class, at the end of our classes, it's not recorded. We actually have an engagement time to enact exactly what I'm talking about right here, giving each one of us an opportunity to share. But that's only for those that are here during the live class. If you'd like to be a part, there is a link in the description below. So, when I begin to look at this place of, of the word and looking at it from the place of where the Father is telling us and giving us a wealth of his wisdom and the wealth of understanding out of the word itself, then we have a place where, oh, help me out here, Father. Let me just share it to you this way, because the Lord took me through this quite some time ago. And when he did, it really began to, to mess with me a good bit. Now I've come full circle back to this place again. And now I'm seeing it right in the scripture itself, where it it says exactly what I heard the word of the Lord to me was all about and didn't realize it was necessarily a scripture. I just know that it was a word of the Lord to me. And what I was talking, what I'm talking about is he began to walk me through a particular uh, study, and, and it was from that study that I heard the Lord say, slow down, slow down, take your time. And so I read an, a passage out of a book over and over and over and over again for almost two months. Every single day, I would read that same passage. That was as far as I could go because the Lord wouldn't let me go any further. And it's actually the the opening statement or the opening idea of where I just got done talking about the analogy that I just gave you just a few moments ago about 
wisdom being one. And and he and when he was doing this, as he was doing this, what my heart cry began to be was, Lord, I don't want to get to a place where I'm just rushing through your word to to speak, to just speak. I know, Lord, you've given me a ministry, and I'm thankful for that, but I never want to just get up and speak just to speak. I I want those things that come out of my heart and out of my mouth to be those things where I've spent time with. I have taken the time to to walk through them, to think through them, to meditate on them, to to understand them the best way that I possibly can look at it. Why? Because I want it to be a part of me. How in the world do can I think that I could preach or speak or or anything with anybody if I haven't first taken that word, judged it against myself, and then begun to make changes as the Lord begins to reveal to me those changes that I need to make? Then if if because if I'm if I'm not if I'm not doing anything else than that, then I'm not practicing what I preach. I'm just saying something just to make it sound like it's good. And that's not my heart at all whatsoever. I think you guys know, those of you that have been with me for a while know the expression of my heart when it comes to this, because I I I love the Lord my God with all of my heart, my mind, my soul, and my strength. And so even the simplest terms, even the simplest words, even the simplest vowel sounds. We just went through, we just finished up our School of Living Letters a couple of weeks ago, and, and we finished up teaching about the vowel sounds, the smallest part of the Hebrew language itself that's not even in the Torah itself. Why? Because it's seen. The smaller something is in the Hebraic perspective, the smaller it is, the greater it is. And so the vowel sounds are seen as an expression of the Father himself. And so we begin to see how even the the way that a particular word is pronounced and the vowel sounds that are attached to that begin to open up yet another beautiful expression of the Father telling us who we are in him and who he is in us. I don't know about you, but to me, it just makes me love him all that much more to know that in 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 the most minutest of details, in the most intentional of ways, the father says, hey, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out. And I have made you to be kings. Search me out. Find my word. When you find my word, count it as a treasure. Count it as a priceless treasure. Don't just disregard it and think, oh, that's just another diamond of another diamond that I've already had. But no, Father, thank you, because this diamond right here is the most beautiful diamond that I could ever see. And right now you have me focusing on this diamond. Yeah, you may give me some other diamonds, but that's okay right now. I need to know this diamond because I, when I know this diamond, using that metaphor that I used earlier, when I know this diamond so intimately, even if I leave this, this actual hole, right, it's actually a crystal, but when I leave this at home, it's irrelevant. Why? Because the diamond is in here. It's become a part of me. You following me? It becomes a part of the treasure of who I am. And so, you know, if if we look at this from the place of our time of study, our time. Now, I'm, am I am I telling you that some people say, well, I don't I just don't have a whole lot of time to study and blah, 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 blah. And I understand that there are times that that even I don't get a chance to sit down as often as I'd like to. Or there are things that I have to get done. And so there's a busyness that goes on in the midst of all of that. And so, uh, and I've, and, and there's been a part of me that's thought, huh, well, wait a minute. I'm for father. I, I don't want to forget you. You know, in other words, I begin to make uh, a religious expression inside of myself that says, well, I have to sit down and I have to do this and I have to. Okay. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. All right. I want to go back to this analogy again just a few moments ago, because I actually had a conversation about this the other day. 
And uh, I want to go back to the same diamond, because if we if we see that each one of us are a facet of this diamond. So if I'm this facet, then each and every one of you are one of the other facets along the same side of the diamond. And each one of us are an expression of the father. Then. When I sit down or when I spend time with one of you or when I spend time with someone uh, uh, who the father has me in front of at that moment. Am I not also spending time with Father by doing so? Have you thought about that? We diminish one another by by saying, "I don't recognize." I, I, I tell you what, I love, I love. I know some of you may may not like me when I say this, and some of you may think I'm crazy when I say this. But hear me out with the expression of this. I love the term Namaste. I love it. Why? Because one of the definitions, at least the one that I choose to, um, I choose to look at, it is that is Namaste means the divine in me sees and recognizes the divine that is in you. Stop. Let's just think about that for just a moment. The divine, the the Father in me. Let's put it a little more Christian. The Father in me sees and recognizes the Father in you. Now, this can be seen from a couple of other ways. The light in me sees and recognizes the light in you. But the the, the definition that I choose it to, to look at is that the, that place of the divine. So how much more so is that when we get the chance to be able to sit down and spend time with one another? You know, I've and I've used this argument. It's funny because I've been hearing it uh, a little bit here lately. I've been I've used this argument before. If we are, if you, if the Father is in you and the Father is in me, let's carry out the same the same thought. Then, when I approach you, should I not approach you in the same protocol and manner as if I approach the Father Himself? Right. So for those of you that are just hearing me, I've said this quite a bit, but it begins to open up a perspective as we begin to honor one another in who Father has made us to be. So all of this is going back to this place place of wealth and and where we're talking about with not only wealth in, in, in finances, but also wealth in the place of the word of God, because Sometimes we look at prayer and we count prayer as being that place of us spending time with Father. And to a certain extent, that is. Okay, I don't want to diminish that. That's not what that's not my heart here. But many times when we go to prayer, we're usually asking the Father for something, where there's some something that we need that we're dealing with and we're trying to to overcome or we're trying to deal with, or we need to ask the father for an immediate need or those sort of things. Uh, But, and that's good because there's, there's an expression between us and the father when it, when it, uh, when we do that, but how do we really get to know father? We get to know him out of the word. Remember Yeshua himself, John chapter one. That that said that, um, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Right? And so, the more that I spend time in in his word, the more that I begin to, the, the more light, the more understanding, the, the, it's kind of like, and I'm probably getting a, hell, a little bit ahead of myself. I'll come back to this in just a few minutes. But, uh, but let me finish out this this thought. It's kind of like being in a place where uh, you're walking down a path, and uh, if it's dark, then there could be a pit hole right in front of you. You'd never see it. But 
in the scripture says that that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path, then his word becomes a light. So as I'm walking down this path, even though others may see it as a as a place of darkness, his word in me has begun to show and shine a light around me, and I'm able to see that pit before I fall into it. Are you following it? Are you following me? So I I'm, I'm I want to encourage each and every one of us to to spend time. I mean, this is the great thing about these classes is it gives us an opportunity to to join together and to be able to dig into the word together as as well as being able to hear different perspectives of what Father is releasing about something. So, let's continue on. This was the verse I wanted to get to today. In the King James, it says this, hope deferred makes the heart sick. The Passion Translation, uh, Dr. Simmons writes this, when hope's dream seems to drag on and on, the delay can be depressing. But when at last your dream comes true, life's sweetness will satisfy your soul. I promise you one thing. If there's any one verse that I have quoted over 40 years <laughs> or more in my life, it has been this one. And there were times that I literally thought I was going to die because I, I, I just, it was, it was hope constantly being deferred. But I had to stop and ask the question, why is hope deferred? In some cases, it, it, in, in, the, in this case for me, the reason it took 40 years was my own fault, it was absolutely my own fault. And I recognized that uh, later, as 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 time went on, I began to recognize I'm the one. I need to deal with things, and I wasn't allowing myself the opportunity to deal with those things. I wasn't taking the time or thinking that that it really was that big of a deal. And Father was teaching me, "Oh, it's very much a big deal. The little things are a big deal." And I thank Apostle Aaron Smith for that one because. I know one of the things that he taught over many, many years was this place of, if you want to be successful, there are three things that you have to do. Take care of the little things, manage your money, and take care of another man's things. Or, or honor another man's things, however you want to put that. But the first thing was taking care of the little things. And Father began to teach me that that I was deferring my own hope because I wasn't really willing to to take care of my my own self. There are other times that hope is deferred for a purpose, and there's an intention behind it. You know, if we look in Scripture, it's funny because I, I it's a this is this is the the beauty of the paradox yet again, because in Scripture we begin to see that. There have there were many times throughout scripture where it talked about in the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, right? And so there were things that needed to occur in order for something to happen. Well, God's not held or bound by the uh linear time that we ourselves are are a part of. And actually, truth be told, we're not either. We are not held or bound by the, the place of linear time. Linear time being that time only moves forward, never moves backwards, and that we're always moving towards the place of going towards the future, the past always being behind us. And the moment, the place of where we are right now is the present, right? Well, the truth is, is that the scripture begins to talk about this place of, of where if father is beyond time, and this is an argument I use all the time, if father is beyond time, and I'm in him and he's in me, then I'm beyond time. And so I'm not bound by that, that place of, of linear time. However, at the same breath, and this is the paradox, I've got this place where I'm not bound by time, but yet there is a place of the fullness of time. And uh, if, you, if you've got the answer to that, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> because it's one of those things where it's it's listening to, for me, this is what I've come to with regards to this. I've come to this place of saying, okay, Lord, that I recognize that in the place of where I am right now, let me give an example just so that it, it makes sense. Let's say I'm praying and believing for a large sum of money, all right? And, and the Lord says that... Uh, um, 
and I'm, I'm looking at this place of, of being beyond time. As I recognize that Father has already given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. And the truth is, is that from my perspective right now, even if even if that money is not tangible in my hand at the moment, it's irrelevant. My heart expresses the place of the I'm, I'm the richest man in the world. Why? Because Father has already given it to me. And so I'm I'm operating. So now, now, now let's let's go back to some scriptures that we used to hear for years and years and years. Give thanks, right? Give thanks. What about the the whole idea behind faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, right? So it's now we're now we're getting to the whole aspect behind faith and the opportunity. Well, faith says, and I can prove this to you in Hebrew. Faith says that I already have it. But yet at the same breath, there's a full, there can be a fullness of time. How do I know the difference? The only way that I can tell you that, that Father has helped me in this, in knowing the difference between the two, has been in that place of the peace, of his peace in my heart. In other words, I know that I've, I already have it, regardless of whether I can see the tangibility of it right here or right now, is irrelevant. I believe that I've already received it. It's already there. It's already taken care of. And so from that place, my attitude is not one of crying out and being upset with the Father because it's been delayed or it's seemingly been delayed, but thanking him for what he's already given me. That makes sense? I hope it does. Because it really, it really changes. So it... The question goes back to then, what is the intention of your heart? And what's the intention of my heart? Well, my heart is the Father, you've already given me. Everything that I have has come from you. Everything. Every breath, every bit of love, every every bit of finances, every bit of life, every bit of, of everything has already come from you. What can I give back to you? In, in the in the midst of all of this, except out of the intention of my own heart saying, Lord, I love you. Oh, man, this has been something that's been beating in my heart for for months now. And and I'm I've I'm I'm I, I, I can't express it enough. The intentionality of Father, I love you with all of my heart, my mind, my soul, and my strength, regardless of what my eyes see, regardless of what, what's going on in the world around me, regardless of what's happening. I love you with all of my heart, my mind, and my soul and strength because I want to. Not because I have to, but because I want to. Thank you that every day I get to go to your word and you begin to open it up in such a way that I begin to see even more of who you are and, and the things that you've already given me. I just didn't realize that I already had. And I can be established in that peace that passes all understanding. And that peace that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and our mind so that we're not worried about those other things. Are you following me? What is the intention of my heart in that? It's funny when when you look at it from the Mishlei, the Mishlei begins to talk about it, and and it looks at it a little bit differently from the Western mindset. Because that scripture, to from the Hebraic perspective, refers to a friend who has promised to help, but delays or forgets his promise. So how do we handle the delay? Well, the truth is, is that's exactly what I've just been talking about. How do we handle what appears to be a delay? Because in that place, our hearts do grow sick if we're focused on... See, for me, poor Rebbe, help me out here, Holy Spirit. For me... A lot of it had to do, hopefully this will help you. If it doesn't, then just skip past it. 
But for me, what I noticed that I was doing was that when hope came, I painted a picture of what I thought hope would look like. As I was progressing through that, the picture of what I thought would happen began to not come true. And at least not the way that I had saw it. And so from that place, because I had painted this picture in myself, I'm talking about me, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. As I had painted this picture, if anything happened that would have attributed to or, or been connected to the very revealing of that hope, I would dismiss it because it didn't fit the picture of what I thought it should look like. Are you following me? So for me, what I began to discover was that that I needed to, to, to guard my heart and my mind of boxing God in from the way that I thought he was going to accomplish that place of the hope. Because in this case, he is the friend, right? He becomes the friend. If I, if I use this definition, then Father is that friend. Friend who has promised to help, but delays or forgets. Well, God's never going to forget, so you can wipe that part off. But there seems to be a delay there. Well, maybe he hasn't delayed, but it's been the picture of what I thought the hope would realize as, and it wasn't looking the way that I thought it should. So I don't know about you, but for me, the Father began to to show me this place of resting completely and fulling in Him. And really the question is, well, then how do we handle this delay? How do we handle what appears to be a, a delay? All I can tell you, and all I can tell you is what as to what, what helped me was just resting in Him. And that was rather difficult for a long time. Huh. To learn that place. And I'm, I'll be honest with you. You want to know the truth? I'm still dealing with it. Still deal with it every day. Still deal with that place of, of learning to say, oh, Lord, forgive me. I, I know I'm getting wrapped up in this whole aspect of, of what I, of, 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 of this picture that I've still, I'm still creating. And, and knowing that, Lord, all I have to do is look at the earth. All I have to do is look at the flowers. All I have to do is look at the trees, look at the birds of the air. Because you've always taken care of them. How much more so as sons, I'm using Paul's argument, how much more as sons will you take will you not take care of us? Father, there is there has been two things that have been out of my mouth more than anything over the last several months. Father, I love you with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Number one. And Father, I trust you. I trust you. You know, when we say faith without works is dead, don't look at trust as not being something that you're doing. Faith requires you do, excuse me, trust requires that you do something, right? I can, let me use an argument. I can sit down in a chair and trust that that chair will hold me up, right? Well, I've had experience, so I know that that chair will normally hold me up. Not a problem. But so through time, through trust, I now have confidence in that chair being having the ability to be able to hold me up. You following me? So, but it requires what? That I walk up to the chair and I sit my butt down. That's what brought about the first initial bit of trust and then confidence as I continued on in that. But at, when at last your dream comes true, the Michelet says it this way, because I haven't read. A drawn out hope sickens the heart, but desire attained is a tree of life. Amen. I know one of the biggest things for me was actually being in ministry. I had believed that I was meant to be since I was 12 years old, and, and it had eluded me for nearly 40 years. And, and, and that was one of the things where I had the biggest place of the sickness of my heart. And, and when Father began to walk me through, even before we had actually stepped out and began to do any ministry, 
the the Lord settled inside of my heart one day that let me know, you know what? It doesn't matter. Father, I know I, I trust you and I know you're carrying me through this. I don't know what how it's supposed to look or what it's supposed to look like, but I'm going to walk continuously in you. I'm going to love you with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Because I remember the day and uh, hadn't planned on talking about this, but I hear Holy Spirit saying, go ahead. I remember the day that a father took me into the secret place. And it was a Saturday morning, remember it, and uh, sat down with my cup of coffee in my chair, and I began to pray. And there was something that began to boil up in the inside of my spirit, man. And as I did, I, I, I could see myself standing in the secret place where Father had first taken me into the secret place. And uh, I noticed, I was looking at the grass, and I noticed that the grass was leaning in towards me. I kind of confused me a little bit. I looked over to the the there was a river that 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 father and I created together in the in the secret place. And there was these trees and flowers and all of that that were over to my left. And I noticed that the the leaves were of the trees were were kind of leaning in. The 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 river or the brook that was there had all these little stones in it. And you could hear, most of the time you could hear the babbling of that brook. You could hear the sounds of the, the water going over the stones. Um, but I could see that the water was going over the stones, but they seemed to be silent for a purpose. I looked towards the mountain that was in the secret place and the mountain looked like it was leaning in towards me. But what blew me away the most was at a distance and yet right in front of my face, I could see the Father, and He was leaning in as, as if He was waiting to hear me say something. And so this word began to bubble up out of my spirit, man. And, and so from out of the place of the secret place, I began to pray in tongues. And uh, I just pray, I prayed for probably 20, maybe even 30 minutes of this thing that was coming. It was very... I remember it was a very passionate place of just digging up the very, from the very core of my soul and crying out to the Lord. And when I when I when it was finished, I remember looking around again and being absolutely blown away at how creation and and, and above all, Father had stopped, leaned in, and was listening to what I was saying in the midst of it. So in the spirit, I fell on my face. And I was like, Lord, how could, how could not only you, but all of creation do what you just did? You were, I, I felt like everything it had stopped just to hear me at this particular moment. How could that, how could that be? And I heard the Lord say this, it's not just because of what you said. So in other words, it was it had, did have to do with what I was saying in this praying in tongues. He said, it's not just because of what you said. It's because a son has been revealed. When he said that, I recognized from that point that Father has that the, the promises that the Father had made were yes and amen, even if I couldn't see him even at that moment, because there became a, a confidence in me that said, Father, I'm moving in the right direction. I know that you have placed me here. And if nothing else, if nothing else, then I, I am... Oh, poor Rebecca. It was from that point that I recognized the most important part of my ministry was to him, period. He was the one that I was meant to minister to. Everything else comes as a comes as a, a outcropping of that. Father, I want to minister to you. It became a tree of life that had been planted by the streams of the living water. The streams that I showed that I was telling you about inside of the secret place was a part of that. And he was planting me as a son. And that's all I needed to hear. Father, that you have called me son. Verse 13. Let's continue on. Despise the word, will you? 
then you'll pay the price and it won't be pretty. But the one who honors the father's holy instructions will be rewarded. And yeah, that's absolutely true. Let's look at it from the Mishle. In the Mishle, it says, he who scorns a word will himself be harmed, but he who reveres a commandment will be rewarded. And so, you know, when we when we look at this, it goes back to two questions that that those of you that have been with me a while have heard 90 billion times if you've heard it once. There are two questions that have been more beneficial and more helped me more than anything else that I could ever imagine. And these two questions were, what do you see and how do you see it? All right. Now, later on, the Lord added a third question because he wanted me to look a little bit deeper. <clears throat> and the third question was, why do you see it that way? What do you see? How do you see it? And why do you see it that way? And the reason it began to help me because I began to realize that sometimes the way I saw things, I was judging it against an old religious way of, see, of, of, of seeing things and not against that place of who Father is. Now, I could go into a myriad of things, and we've talked a good bit about a lot of that already. When, let me give you one quick example, and that's the place of, you know, when we go through difficulties. Are difficulties a bad thing? Are difficulties of the devil? Where the devil is coming against us and trying to stop us from doing something? Or is a difficulty a place of a challenge where I'm that the father has he, number one, he didn't do evil. He's not tempting me. He's not testing me, but he is, he's taking me through this place of a challenge to recognize there is something more inside of me than I realized that I had from before. How can, how can anyone grow any kind of muscles unless they put their muscles against some sort of resistance that allows those muscles to break down and then remint and then creating more strength as well as a largeness when it comes to the, the muscles themselves, right? So in other words, what do I see and how do I see it can even go back to that place of, of I used to take and, and, and would rebuke the devil for things that later on I was like, wait a minute, how many times have I rebuked you, Satan, <laughs> for something that God was trying to walk me through to teach me the strength that I already had on the inside of me that he had already given me? How many times? And so this, this to me, this verse begins to, to continue on with this place. Despise the word, will you? And uh, the Michele, he who scorns a word, I've already read this, but I'm going to read it again. He who scorns a word will himself be harmed, but he reveres a command will be rewarded. So let me get back to this. What do you see and how do you see it? Because one of the ways that we can look at this scripture has to do with the place of hearing wisdom. You know, I've, when we look at something from the place of walking through a situation or walking through a day or whatever the case may be, there are people that we honor and people that, that, uh, uh, maybe that father has has connected you with as a way of being able to stir something up within you that should be true of all of us that that uh that even though i'm teaching here today and you guys may be joining because you, you wanted to hear the things that the father has been showing me um i have to have people that i go to and listen to and and get and gain or glean from as well because of that and i do the same thing with you because remember in this class I've told you before many, many times, we um, there is an equality amongst all of us. I, I am a teacher amongst teachers. I am a king amongst kings. I am a son amongst sons. And I'm a priest amongst priests. So each and every one of us are on the same level here. And so as we sit together and spend this time with one another, we begin to, to hear. So when wisdom comes, do we only receive it because it only comes through the way that we thought it should come? through maybe someone we honor and trust? Or can we open up our hearts to that place 
of recognizing even the, the, the guy who cusses us out, maybe because we cut him off in traffic. You guys have heard me say this before. Maybe because, you know, we've cut him off in traffic. But he says something that is out of the pure, pure wisdom of the Father himself, and he speaks to you out of that place. Can you open your heart up to be able to receive those things that you know is from Father? Now, I'm not talking about, you know, because that same guy who may be cussing you out might be throwing in a bunch of superlatives that have nothing to do with you at all whatsoever. I guess the point I'm trying to make is is I, I keep thinking about every time I bring that up, I always think about Balaam's donkey. Right? Balaam's donkey. Where the donkey kept trying to tell Balaam what was going on, but the Balaam wouldn't listen. Balaam wasn't, you know, the donkey was responding in the only way that he could by stopping until God did what? He opened up the mouth of the donkey and said, Hey, I ain't going any further. There's a big old angel here with a big sword about ready to cut us to pieces, and I am not moving in that direction. That's my paraphrase to what was said there. <laughs> but you, you see what I'm saying? So how can we, can we not look at this? Are we willing to open up our hearts to hear a rebuke from an elder or a stranger? Be honest with you, the, the, the truth is, is that when we, from those that we honor and trust, it's a much easier pill to swallow. Agreed? It's a much easier uh, understanding because it's coming in a very sweet way. I'm just, I'm just opening up that place of saying, let's look, let's look, look beyond, right? Let's look past and not negate something just because we count it as little or nothing. Now I brought up the dime because I talked about that earlier. Don't negate something because we count it as little or nothing. Remember that the smallest thing in the kingdom is greater than anything else. The greatest among you is the servant of all. The smallest vowel sound in the way that a word is pronounced and spoken and the intentionality behind the way that word is pronounced and spoken is of great wealth. Because just the sound itself reveals a, a, a depth of who the Father thinks and sees about us. Make sense? Now, I know some of you, that may seem a little cryptic. Join us in the School of Living Letters. <laughs> we're, we're right in the middle of, uh, of, of doing our, our enrollment for next year. So we'd love for you to join us in the School of the Living Letters. And we'll be teaching some of these exact things of what I'm alluding to right now. Let's continue on. Verse 14. The teaching of a wise man is a source of life. To turn him away... From the snares of death. Okay, so what is a wise man? First off, how how do we determine what a wise man is? Well, remember we talked about wisdom earlier when we talked about the place of wisdom is one. Wisdom is echad, and Hebrew that's the Hebrew word for one. And in that place of of wisdom being one, I recognize that the understanding of what Father has given me is the wisdom that He's given me. All right. And I also begin to recognize that each and every one of us have a portion of that wisdom because he's given each one of us, he's made each one of us a, a, a facet of his diamond and the expression of who he is. Right. So wh who is a wise man? Is a wise man one who who just seems wise? Well, I, I can. Oh, man. Poor Rebecca, help me out here, Holy Spirit. Because I could go a thousand different directions right here, right now. I've, I've, I've had a teaching where I talked about the two different types of wisdom. There's experiential wisdom, and then there is, um, uh, my brain just went blank. There's experiential wisdom, and there, there's there, there's another term that I usually use, and that's what I'm trying to think of. Um, there is... <laughs> Supernatural? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I thought I think there was another term, but I think it was there's experiential wisdom and there's supernatural wisdom. Thank you, Amy. 
and uh <laughs> I can't <laughs> uh silly sometimes uh sorry I'm, i've got some i've got a conversation going on in my head right at the moment <laughs> but yes experiential wisdom is supernatural wisdom experiential wisdom is one where i experience something and then i learn something as a result of that supernatural wisdom is the wisdom that's given directly from father himself and it's something that i had to have no experience about but he gives me insight into that allows me then to experience it because of that insight. Make sense? So both lead to the fullness of the wisdom. Experience takes me to supernatural. Supernatural takes me through experience. So you see how they all wrap up together and they're all from father, even when it comes to that. So who is wise? It's one who appears to be wise because of experience or appears to be wise because of uh, because of, of supernatural wisdom. All right. So the Mishle begins to open up and says that, that a wise man is one who studies the word, one who studies and takes time. Why? Because the word of God is our source of light. It is our source of life. It is our source of light. It, you remember the woman at the well when Jesus himself said, if I can give you water, living water. How many times throughout scripture does it refer to the word itself as being water? And he says, I will give you living water where you'll never thirst again, right? How many other places throughout scripture does it allude to this place of, of that? So this wisdom is able to bring us to that place of giving light in places where we're having difficulty. You remember I mentioned this earlier, ago, earlier and I talked about a path. And it's funny, for those of you that have been with me a while, uh, it's all every time I talk about the Hebrew word orach, which is uh, a Hebrew word for for path, but there are actually four different Hebrew words that refer to path, and they are, each have a slightly different perspective. Orach, the best way that I can describe this is that is that this is not a path that you would just normally walk down and meander to. This is a path where, as you have been on the path looking for the Father, he takes you on an orach. And, and it's funny because the that as we're walking on this path in Father, the way that I've pictured this path is like trees that have overgrown into the path itself. And I'm having to walk carefully through those trees because if I don't, I'm going to end up getting scratched up and hurt up pretty bad walking through them. Now that almost seems kind of counterintuitive when we when we think, well, Father, shouldn't I be walking through in you in this place of absolute ease? I'll let Holy Spirit answer that question for you. How do you really know who you are? Unless you're walking through a place of difficulty and you have to, you not have to, but you want to. You see, I found myself in that place and I, I found myself not worrying about the trees, but looking into the face of my father and saying, I love you. And I know you're going to carry me through this and I'm not going to get scratched up or hurt as I walk through this. Let me keep my my intention of my heart and my intention of my eyes completely and fully on you. And so as he began to take me along the path, it not only had trees, but it also had pitfalls. There were places where there were pits. These pits were actually built by someone who was wicked, who tried to put a pit in front of of along this path. And I know you're like, wait a minute, this is a path with just you and the Lord. Don't try to figure it out. Just follow along with me. <laughs> because how could the wicked be there and dig a path along this private path with just you and Father? Um, Again, I'm going to let Holy Spirit fill in the details there. I'm not going to answer that question on purpose. As... I have spent time, and as I continue to dig into his word, as I get, begin to continue to meditate on, on him, as I begin to look into what he's telling me out of his word, then the, that his light, his word becomes a light. Thy word is a light, light unto my feet and a lamp, lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, right? 
So the light of him begins to shine out from me so that as I'm going down this path, I see the pitfall in front of me and I don't fall into it. I talked about it earlier, right? And so what I see in this place, what we're talking about here is, is this place. I can't, I can't stress enough about how the word of God takes us to a place that prayer can't. funny because I'm, I'm i'm thinking about a time where i was actually told by someone that that i spent too much time studying that that i i had a lot of book knowledge and didn't have a lot of of experiential knowledge truth be told they were right they were absolutely right at the time i didn't but that time that i was walking through that also became a foundation that as the Lord began to open my eyes and see more of what he was trying to say out of his word, things began to make more sense. I don't know about you, but one of the things that I've cried out for more than anything else is, Lord, help me to understand. I don't think your word is as difficult as religion has tried to make it out to be. Religion tells me that it it's it's super difficult there's no way that I'll never know you know and your ways are higher than than my ways and your thoughts are higher than my thoughts right i love that because when i went into the scripture and began to look at that hebrew word for higher there do you do you want to know what that word higher there says it says to draw you up to cause you to be lifted up to soar. And when I recognized what that said, I was like, wait a minute, my ways are meant to cause you to be lifted up and to soar so that your ways become like my ways. Your thoughts become like my thoughts. It's not an excuse to say, I can't understand. It's a call that says, come up here. Because I am drawing you up higher so that your ways are my ways. Your thoughts are my thoughts. I know who my father is because I see his face and I do what I see him do, said Yeshua himself. How much more so is that true with us? Are you following me? He wants to lift us up. He wants to cause us to soar. Not to give an excuse of, of, of being dumb. Sick and tired of that old that old expression. Because that's exactly what it brings us down to. Well, I guess I'm just never going to know. Because his ways are higher than my ways. And his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Blech. The teaching of a wise man is a source of life. Why? To turn him away from the snares of death. I don't have to worry. Why? Because his light is, 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 is showing me any snare that's in front of me. It's showing me the place where I don't have to fall into sin. I don't have to make a mistake. I don't even have to worry about whether or not I'm doing something exactly right or not. Now, I, 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 I might be getting a little bit deep in this, and uh, it's just I, I had a, I had a, I was meditating on this the other day, and and uh, I had a conversation with a buddy of mine, and just to skip through it, I connected in what we were talking about to the place of uh, to the story of the rich young ruler. All right. I'm not worried. I'm not going to tell you about what the conversation was about because it doesn't fit. It, it does, but it doesn't. I just don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about what we talked about. But it began to open up the place of the rich young ruler. And when I got to the, the, the rich young ruler, I began to look at what the what Yeshua himself said to the rich young ruler. And, you know, because the rich young ruler came up and said, I've done everything that I was supposed to. I've, you know, I've I followed the commands. 
I have I have been faultless in the place of of uh, following the commandments of God, the mitzvos. And uh, Yeshua doesn't tell him that he didn't. If you, if you go back and look, he doesn't say, you know, you know, oh yes, you did. You fell here and you fell there, and you no, that's not Yeshua's response in this. Matter of fact, he kind of skipped over that whole part of of all of that. And uh, he says, he says, uh, yes, essentially, he basically says, yes, you have, um, or yes, you have, you've done, you've done right. However, there's one thing you lack. That was the key point I'm trying to make up. There's one thing you lack. The first statement, he actually makes five in the midst of this. I just want to go through the first one. The first thing he says is, go your way. Go thy way. In other words, I had a conversation about this with someone, and and, uh, it reminded me of one of the Torah portions in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 12. There's a Torah portion that the name of it is called Lech Lecha. And Lech Lecha means go forth. And this is the place out of out of Genesis 12 where Abraham was told by God to leave your father and your mother to go out and I will show it to the country that I will show you where to go. All right. So this is where it comes from. However, when you look at that term, the Hebrew term Lech Lecha, and you begin to uh, see other ways of that being translated, when it comes to Hebrew, there's no one specific way that something can be translated. It always has a myriad of ways that it can be seen. One thing does not always mean just one thing. One thing means a multiplicity of things. It's a facet of a diamond. It's like a, a diamond in and of itself, and it has its own facets of expression of what it's talking about. And lech lecha, one of the things that it talks about is, or one of the other ways that it can be interpreted is Go and find yourself. Go find yourself. So what does that mean, go and find yourself? For me, it was a 40-year journey. For me, it was a walking through of that place of crying out and saying, Father, I just don't understand. This whole religious way of seeing things just doesn't fit. I hear people what they say, and I know they're well-meaning, but I know your word is true. And 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 I, I just don't understand how... All of this can come. So the Lord took me in a place of a, of a desert path to walk me in through a place of being able to find myself, to find out who I really am, to find out that there was something more to me than even what my own mind was trying to, to tell me. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of my mind, because my mind kept telling me I was something because it was trying to fit within a religious box and it wasn't working. But as he walked me through this place and began to, to reveal, I began to see, wait a minute. Your word brings me to that place of being fully and completely in you. All right, verse 15 believe that's where I left off. Good sense provides grace in the Michele, but the way of traitors is harsh. In the uh, Passion Translation, Dr. Simmons says, everyone admires a wise, sensible person, but the treacherous walk pat on the path of ruin. So let's go back to kind of a little bit of what we were talking about. Well, what have we been talking about? You see, one of the things that this particular verse begins to open up about talks about someone with good sense. Now, we're not even talking about Torah. We're not talking about spending time in the Word. We're not talking about any of that. I'm talking about someone who just has good sense. If you stop and think about it, there are times that in our lives where we've done those things which are right because our heart tells us to do that was right, even if we didn't know that right way of being able to do something, right? Now our hearts have done, our, our minds have done the same thing to us when we've done the wrong thing as well. This verse begins to open up the place of with someone with good sense and doing what is right. It provides grace and he finds favor in the eyes of God. So 
some of you may some of you may say, well, I don't I don't know the word that well. I don't know, but I know there's something in my heart that keeps telling me the right way to go. Well, if you want to find a scripture that tells you you're exactly where you need to be right now, this is that scripture. Because it's it's telling you that that in this place where you have the good sense to hear the Father out of your heart, then um, then then He's going to provide grace along that path, and He you find favor in God's eyes. Now, if we take that even deeper, and out of that place of the good sense, we find you know you know it's kind of like going back to that that statement of what I said just a, a moment ago. And and that was that place of of um, my apologies, Joe. That was that place of I got just totally knocked off of. <laughs> Help me out here, Holy Spirit. Help me out. Talking about spending time with the Word. Someone with both sense and who spends time in the word and also has good character traits, this is what the Michelet talks about, um, will find favor in everyone's eyes. And so when we look at this, It kind of takes everything that we've been talking about up to this point, and it allows us to see this place of, of sometimes when we walk through something, we have difficulties. And a lot of times we judge ourselves against those, those difficulties, and we think that uh, we're not doing what we need to be doing, and we're not being perfect in what we need to be doing. You know, I had a conversation with with someone just here recently about about just that, where when when we when we look at at, at the way that we should, do, sometimes religion tries to take us back into that place of well, I have to spend time and I got to do this and I got to do that, and and I judge myself based on whether or not I've taken the the time that I always want to take and blah 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 blah. Uh, regardless of what life has, has has been throwing at me at that particular day, I, I I've not done this and I've done it. And then I judge myself at the end of the day, saying, "Well, I failed, right? I failed in what the the Lord was what I what I felt like my picture of what I was supposed to be like for that day." And so. Looking at it from a, an, an outside perspective, well, actually, let's, I'm looking at it from an inside perspective here. When you begin to admire yourself as a wise and sensible person, in other words, I do I have to be bound by those religious things? I mentioned it earlier. Remember how I said that sometimes when the Lord doesn't give, you know, when we don't have an opportunity, not what the Lord does. When we don't have an opportunity because of life or busyness to spend some time with the Father and spend some time with the Word, that that He may not give us an opportunity to to, or we may not have an opportunity that day to be able to get into His Word. But when we talk to one another, then we're sharing. So let's 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 first look at ourselves and recognize the place the Father has made us a wise and a sensible person. He's given us that place where He's given us His favor. And his grace. Be honest with you, this particular verse kind of helped. I was struggled a little bit with the understanding, at least fully, of this. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie. This one just I it it kind of looked at things too almost too esoterically, too outside of, of everything. Um, and it began to judge this place of of the of of, of who is 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 admired and who is uh who is walking on a path of ruin. But the truth is, is this this particular verse is one for me, at least it's what I hear the Holy Spirit telling me even right now. It's kind of a way of looking at ourselves and saying, okay, how do you see yourself? How do you determine? How do you judge yourself at the end of the day? How do you judge yourself throughout the day? When, when things don't happen this way, the exact way you thought they should for a particular day, how do you judge yourself? 
How do you look at yourself? Because in the place of me, of, of, of me wrapping myself up fully in him, <laughs> who walks in this place of a wise and, and sensibility, then... Um, um, come to the very last verse and all of a sudden I'm struggling a good bit here. You know, I, I, I'm still struggling with this, with this revelation. Um, because there's a part of me that I'm like, I really don't care what other people think about me. <laughs> but then there's a part of me that says that I do care about what other people think about. And it makes me go back to that place of almost judging myself against the way others see me. That's what this, and that's why I think that's why I'm struggling with this verse so much, because it, it tries to, it tries to allude to the place. Well, how do others see you? Um, I always take scripture and make it personal before I do anything else. And that's what I'm doing here. And, and so do people see me as treacherous or do they admire me? How, how, how is it? Is there a place where I should be concerned about those things? Truth be told, yeah, I believe there is. I believe there's a place where I don't, I, I can be mindful of, but not bound by. Be mindful of in the sense when I recognize that it's the word of the Lord being spoken in a situation, and when I realize that it's not, and it's just the the heart of someone who's who's got something against me. So. As you look at this, and as we as we go into the time of of our engagement, you know, let's let's talk about this because again, I've I've struggled a good bit. This I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie to you and try to walk through something and make it sound like I'm I'm wise or something when I'm struggling with it, right? So, Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for the expression of yourself in this and how you have opened up and taught us to become more like you, to be mindful, but not be bound by, to be thoughtful, but yet trusting, to be in faith, yet knowing to be in the place where you're carrying me through, where your ways are higher, but you're meaning to lift me up so that my ways are like your ways. My thoughts are like your thoughts. My heart is like yours and the facet of who you've made me to be is shining abroad into the earth because it's your light that is being shown out of me and not my light, but Father, your light. Let me be that reflective light of you in everything that I do. And so it is from this place that I say this. Ivarechacha Adonai ve'ishmarecha Ye'er Adonai panavalecha v'chunecha Yesa Adonai panavalecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face, yes, his countenance, his presence towards you and give you peace. Blessings and shalom.